Oh, every time you guys hear special announcement, you're probably going to be triggered. <laughs> well, I was reminded this morning that this was the last sunrise of summer. What a bearer of good news. Anyway, we're heading into a new season, fall, it's beautiful, and every season has its gifts, doesn't it? Now, I'm still looking for the winter ones, but people tell me there are gifts of winter. Uh, but we are heading into a new season here at Lakeside, and uh, we don't know what God is up to, but I'm excited to find out what that will be. Last week, we started a new series to kick off the year, actually, because our year sort of runs with the school year, September to June, and we asked this you know, simple question. What does it mean to be the church? And I don't mean go to church, I mean be the church. Like, who are we? Why do we do what we do? What exactly is the church? And you know, that's a question that the last couple of generations has been asking. And there was a study done this year, a Canadian study done by two Canadian scholars, one here at the University of Waterloo, and they asked millennials, those who are spiritual but not religious, why they left the church. And believe me, they left the church in droves. That might be the generation that we could call uh, the generation of the great exodus. They have a hunger for God, a hunger for a higher power, but they weren't finding it in church. And so they left by droves. And so these scholars um, collected a bunch of millennials and asked them the question, why did you leave? And here are the four top results of why they left. First of all, they said the church is, this is their experience of the church. The church is anti-modern, anti-intellectual, and superstitious. Second one, dogmatic, inflexible, and ignorant, perpetuating hate and discrimination. The third reason, the impact of the American Christian right, blending conservative politics with Christianity. And the fourth, the mistreatment of indigenous people. Those are the four main reasons people who previously were part of a church, a community of faith, left. And for comparison, in the 1950s, the overall view of Christianity was positive. Today, for millennials and Gen Z, the overall view is negative. As a matter of fact, the overall view of religion as a whole is negative. And Christians and Muslims are held with equal contempt. Muslims for radicalization and violence, and Christians because of our association with the American right. Does that mean all Christians fall into that category? No. Does that mean all Muslims fall into that category? No. But the overall impression of Christianity is negative. And if you're a Jesus follower, you scratch your head and you go, how can that be? Because when Jesus was parting with his disciples and saying goodbye, he said, the overall impression would be this. John 13, 34, he said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. By this, by this radical love that draws the attention of others. And Jesus said it three times. It's the Hebrew way, he spoke Hebrew, it's the Hebrew way of emphasis. There was no italics, there was no bold type, there was no underlining. They said things three times. He was emphasizing, this is important, I want you to hear it. And the outcome of their radical lifestyle, their radical love was that everyone would know they're Jesus followers. Everyone would see and think, wow, this is the dream of God. This is what it looks like to live life as God intends it. The general consensus would be positive. And these survey responses are so far from Jesus' vision of the church, a vision that we wanna recover here at Lakeside. Last week we looked at the word ekklesia, it's the Greek word for church. When Jesus chose a word, to say, this is how my followers will be called. He used multiple, body of Christ, but he picked up this word, ecclesia, from the general lexicon. It was not a religious word, it wasn't a churchy word. It actually came from civic politics. And it meant a group of citizens called to make decisions for the common good. A group of citizens called to make decisions for the common good. 
Scholar James Smith said, it's like God's town hall meeting. The common good, that's restoration. Restoration is at the heart of what it means to be the church, and love is the engine. The earliest observers and the historians who followed Jesus' followers, this new movement, who were checking them out, who were writing about them, weren't impressed at all by their religious practices, by their religious rituals. And as a matter of fact, they were confused by them and they were repulsed by them. They, were, they considered the early Christians to be atheists because they didn't worship all of the gods of the Roman pantheon. They thought they were cannibals because of the way they talked about communion, the Lord's table, when they broke bread and they drank wine together, and this is the body of Christ, and this is the blood of Christ. They thought they were cannibals, they were disgusted. What impressed them was their way of life. What they wrote about was not their Sunday practice, it was the way of life that was dedicated to the restoration of all things. Restoration was Jesus' mandate. So it's our mandate. And restoration is one of the five aspirations we have here at Lakeside. Rachel just went through them. Aspirations of who we believe God is calling us to be. Not just what we do, but who we are. Because our doing comes out of our being. And we believe that God is inviting us to be a people and a place, you'll be able to say these off heart soon, a people and a place of presence where we make space for and we long for the experience of God, the presence of God. We want a people of, to be a people of becoming, becoming more and more like Jesus. I love, or I don't love, how Richard Foster describes this transformation of becoming more like Jesus. He says, in the unguarded moments, there is a spontaneous flow from our inner selves of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no longer the need to hide our inner selves from others. We don't have to work hard at being good and kind. We are good and kind. Doesn't that sound amazing? Except, of course, when the idiot driver cuts me off, right? The unguarded moments when we don't have a chance to gather ourselves and respond well. That's inner transformation, that's becoming more like Jesus when in the unguarded moments, we respond well. And we wanna be a place of deep faith-wide embrace as we plunge into the love of God and we experience it for ourselves. We make room for others to experience the same. And then oasis, safe space, safe people, as Rachel said, as we hold one another's stories and they're sacred to us and there's no judgment and we ask the tough questions and we wrestle with our faith together. And then of course, restoration, which is our focus for this year. Reimagining life as God intends it. Recovering Jesus' vision for the church and repairing brokenness wherever we might find it, in ourselves and in the world. And if you're new here, online or in the room, you're just dipping your toes into faith, or maybe you're returning because you wanna give God one more try. The spiritual but not religious isn't working for you. I just invite you to hang in with us for the next four weeks because we're gonna go discover a God I think that was gonna blow your mind. A God committed to the restoration of all things, us with God, us with each other, us with our own bodies, and us with creation. And today we're looking at the restoration between us and God. And some of this is gonna be new. And some of it is gonna be challenging and maybe uncomfortable, especially if you grew up in church. Because if you grew up in church and your categories for relating to God are around sin and judgment and wrath, and the core of your understanding of God and of self is sin and judgment and wrath. If that's the starting place for understanding God, then some of this is gonna be challenging, but I guarantee it will be liberating. Partnering with God in the restoration of all things begins with understanding who we are in relationship with God. It begins with repairing the brokenness of ourselves with God. 
And for some of us, that means discovering Jesus for the first time. And again, we just started Alpha this week, and there's still room, there's still time to sign up. Alpha is an amazing experience to just dip your toes in, to kick the tires of faith and Jesus and God and church and, and all of that. It starts at 6.30 with dinner, and then the program begins at 7. It's here on a Thursday night in the cafe. There's some folks here, they might be in yellow t-shirts, not sure, with a big question mark. You can ask them about it, or you can ask someone at the guest services. So for others, it may be discovering Jesus. For others, it may be rediscovering who you are, who God is. I'm going to show you what I grew up with, and it's what many of you grew up with. There was people. Does that look like people? People. And we sinned. And we created this huge chasm. Over here is God. And there's this separation here between us and God, and we can no longer get to God. God loves us. God wants a relationship with us, but God can't look on sin. And so there's this giant space. And the only way that God could have a relationship with us is for someone to pay the price. Someone to pay some kind of punishment. And so, and so God sent Jesus to die on a cross. And that's the way that we can get to God. If we find that bridge, if we trust that bridge, then we can get to God. That's what I grew up with. That's what many of you grew up with. Under every religion, just about, is this idea of separation between us and God, between us and the divine. And there needs to be some kind of payment or appeasement, something to get you across this divide and back to God. The God must be pla placated and pleased. The structure of religion is the how. How do we do this? How do we get back across that divide to God? Usually there's rules or sacrifices or prayers or blood or crystals or something depending on the religion. And who decides what's sufficient? Who decides when enough is enough? The religious system. And when we think about it, friends, as Jesus followers, that is a denial of the incarnation. Now, incarnation is just fancy, churchy word for God coming in the flesh. N in Carne flesh, incarnation, God in a bod, God coming as Jesus. But the whole Jesus story, the whole Jesus story is about how God came to us. <laughs> God came to us. We see this at the beginning of our whole story, the beginning of our Bible. And I want to show you something. I want to show you something that's hidden in plain sight, something that challenges all of this. It's part of our origin story, a story that was written to explain the why, why the world is messed up. Now remember, the ancients who were inspired by God to write scripture were concerned with the why, not the how. They didn't have a science mindset. It was why are things the way they are? Why do people do horrible things to each other? Why is life so hard? Why do we fear God? And how do we get back to God? In the creation story, here's the moment when everything went south. We're looking at Genesis 3, verses 6 to 7. This is what scripture tells us. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What was their response? To hide, to cover themselves. Why? Because of shame. Shame causes us to hide. Hide from ourselves, hide from others, hide from God. They hid out of fear. 
Fear of God, why? Because shame causes us to fear. Fear of being found out for who we really are. We're so good at hiding. And our sense of self is so critical to how we perceive the world, how we perceive people, how we perceive God. Most of us leave our childhood with exit wounds. And those wounds impact our view of ourself and our view of God. I had a friend who said, just make sure you leave your kids enough money to get therapy when you're gone. I, I grew up in a wonderful home with wonderful parents. I don't have a traumatic event story. But I was a firstborn. And somehow I received this messaging that I was never good enough. I was never worthy. I could never meet people's expectations. I'm also an Enneagram One. I don't know if any Enneagram people here, I'm an Enneagram One, which means I'm highly self-critical. Regardless of how high the grades were or the awards, it just was never enough at least as I perceived it. And I internalized all my parents' compliments about other people, friends and cousins, whatever, as, as a message that I was not that. I was not good enough. It sounds crazy. It is crazy. This intense fear of failure crept in, fear of anything new, fear of trying anything, fear of adventure. And then you add that to I grew up in a, a loving but very legalistic church. You see, our beliefs inadvertently projected the idea that we had to please God. So many do's and don'ts. It was kind of the unintended consequences of our belief system. And my sense of not enoughness plus my religious experience meant that there's no way I can ever please anybody, never mind God. It was like a trust in Jesus plus all these expectations. And it impacted my view of self and my view of God. God, I figured, would always be disappointed in me. And maybe some of you here feel that. Feel like you've never been able to live up to other people's expectations. You live with a sense of continuous failure or unworthiness. I have good news for you. I have good news for you today. You have different exit wounds than me, and many of you here have way deeper, more hurtful wounding than my little story. But all of them impact our view of self and our view of God. And in the Genesis story, what changed was not God, but Adam. Adam projected his own pain and shame onto God. He was blinded by his shame and he created a God of wrath, a God to fear, not a God of love. And he assumed a separation. You see, shame and fear cause separation, not God. Shame and fear have no place with God. Where is God in this story? He's looking for them. He's seeking them out. This isn't divine hide and seek. God knew exactly where they were. And let's not get caught up either in the arguments of, you know, is this story factual or not, and miss the power of the story. The power of the story. What's being communicated here is that God was looking for them. God was seeking them. There was no separation here from God's point of view. The separation was in their own minds. And it's a challenge for us who may have grown up with this idea of separation from God. It's baked into our understanding of God. And so what does God do? If we go back to the story, verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them, clearly not impressed by their fashion sense. But what is God doing here? Again, let's not miss the power of the story. He is clothing them. He's covering their shame. You see, their attempt is inadequate. And so God stoops. God stoops to their needs and God clothes them. And just a little aside here, clothing in scripture is highly symbolic. It's rich in symbolism. When God clothes, it's a sign of a new identity. It's a sign of acceptance and rightness with God. And so what's God doing in the story? He's discarding their clothing of shame and he's clothing them in God's own identity. 
their beloved. That's God's identity. Those who belong. So we're back to our story. Here they are, hiding in shame. And where is the shame coming from? God? No. But God doesn't say, don't be ashamed. Just stop being ashamed. No, no, no. God meets them in their sense of shame and he covers them. He restores their dignity. Our default settings are separation. Shame and fear need separation to survive. They cause us to hide from ourselves, from others, from God. But God is always moving towards us, always seeking us out. Jesus tells us so in so many of his stories. And if you doubt me, if you doubt me, let's look to Paul. Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. In Christ, God was reconciling, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, which is sin, against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us, the message of restoration to us. Do you see that little footnote there? Some of your Bibles have a footnote. That means that there's another way of translating this. Potentially, it's, it's God was in Christ, reconciling the world, the world to himself. That's actually the correct rendering of the Greek. God was right here in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. It's good news. The good news is not that we can get to God. <laughs> it's that God is coming to us. The good news is not that we can get to God because God killed Jesus to pay the punishment in our place so we didn't have to. No, God was in Christ on the cross. And the good news is that God has come to us despite our trying to kill God. Can we look at just one other verse? There's so many, but I want you to see this one other verse in Colossians 1.16. It's so powerful. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven. Now that's plural, the heavens. It means sky, not the afterlife. Things in the skies and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, all things have been created through him and for him. That's all of creation. Paul leaves absolutely no wiggle room for anything to slip through, and that includes us. That includes us. That means we were created in Christ. And Christ is in God, is in essence God. And therefore, we were in Christ long before we were ever in sin. We were in God from the beginning. This beautiful community of God that, that Christianity calls the Trinity. It's God in three persons, three in one. It's a great mystery. It's a whole other sermon. But the point is there is no separation. There never has been any separation. Friends, no, there is nowhere that we can run to where God isn't. Nowhere we can hide that God isn't. Sin and shame are not our identity. Christ is. Long before we ever heard the word Jesus or God, we were in God, our creator. And long before we ever felt drawn to God or had experiences of God, we were in God, our creator. We have never, ever been separated from God. And God has never been separated from us. It doesn't mean that we don't strive to move towards God. Of course we do. But that's because it starts with God. And so back to restoration. Restoration of people to God, of us to God, it starts from a place of knowing who God is so that we can trust this God. It's not that we can never exhaust knowing God. We'll always be learning and experiencing more and more of God, but it's recovering a correct view of God, not as one to be feared, not as one to be appeased and pleased, not as one who is continually disappointed by us, but as one that is so pleased with us, with you, a God who runs after you, a God who seeks you out to be in relationship, who longs to clothe us in dignity. And restoration starts from a place of knowing who we are, knowing our identity. 
It's not a shame identity, not a fear identity, not a sin identity. It's a loved by God identity. It's a you belong identity, a treasured by God identity. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna let Paul have the last word. He says this in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even ourselves. Nothing we can do will separate us from God. We can try to hide, try to hide behind our shame, but God will continue to pursue us, continue to cross this divide that we've created to find us, to come after us. It's why here at Lakeside, we're passionate about helping people discover Jesus and follow Jesus, discover their true identity as those loved and accepted, created by God, in God, for love. You know, every week I get up here usually and I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm one of the pastors here. And, you know, it's just a piece of information for you. It's not my identity, though. What I should do is come up and say, Hi, I'm Robin, created in Christ for love. And I'm one of the pastors here. That's how the folks that celebrate recovery introduce themselves because they start with their identity, who they are. And Celebrate Recovery is a community that works through hurts, habits, hangups. It's a safe space to process pain and to recover our true identity. It meets every single Monday night here in the cafe at seven. And I mean every Monday night, whether it's Christmas or New Year's, they meet every single Monday night. And you're welcome to join them, seven o'clock on a Monday night. It's why here at Lakeside we strive to become a people in a place of restoration, Begin, beginning with restoration of ourselves with God, restoring our image of who God is, and eliminating any idea of separation, inviting people to discover this, this God of amazing grace and amazing embrace. The renowned Theologian Dr. Baxter Kruger has said this, it's not about you inviting Jesus into your life. It's about Jesus already including you in his. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news. We are in God and nothing can separate us. Nothing in your past, nothing in your future. And this year, as we reimagine life as God intends it, as we strive to recover Jesus' vision of the church, as we try to repair brokenness wherever we may find it, we start here with who God is and who we are. God is love, period. God is love, period. We are in Christ, in God, clothed in dignity and clothed in love, I just wonder as, as Randy creates space for us just to pause, just to reflect for a moment. Is there anything holding you back from knowing or feeling the embrace and the total acceptance of God? You just pause and consider, is there anything, is there something holding you back from knowing, feeling the embrace and the total acceptance of God? Is there something in your past, in your present, that mocks you, causes you to want to hide, or something that makes you feel unworthy? Can you just give that over to God? Ask God to clothe you in belonging and in dignity and in the grace of forgiveness. Maybe even imagine God wrapping you in love and acceptance. Imagination is powerful, and a redeemed imagination allows us to encounter God in different ways. I'm just gonna give you a moment to pause, to allow the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. Let's pause for a moment.
Johanna, Brian, maybe if they're in the room, they could stand up. Um, there's Johanna, Brian, some back at the back there. They'd be happy to chat with you in the atrium after if you want to know more about Celebrate Recovery. If you want to know more about Alpha, um, you can check it out at the uh, guest services. I just wonder if I could just bless us with a benediction before we go today. Our prayer team, oh yeah, our prayer team will be at the front. They're already there. If there's something that you were processing just now and you just... You just need someone to speak embrace over you, to affirm you, to process maybe what came up as you were reflecting. They'd be happy to do that. They love to pray with you. Let me just bless us as we go. May the strength of God sustain you. May the power of God preserve you. May the hands of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. And may the love of God go with you. So go in peace, friends. We love you, Lakeside.